It's similar logic to saying, you know, painters, they create beautiful art that inspires us to see the world in amazing ways. Hitler was a painter. So painters are like Hitler. (laughs) (laughs) That's the same kind of logic that's being employed here. Bringing you law, gospel, and guns. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio, a show about guns, hunting, competition, the natural right of self-defense, and what God's Word says about the issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, and this is episode number 128, brought to you by Cook's Holsters, American-made custom Kydex holsters with a lifetime warranty and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Check them out at cooksholsters.com. Welcome to the show. Thank you for making Armed Lutheran Radio a part of your week. I am so glad that you could join me again today. I hope you had a great week. I actually got out and did some shooting this week. Sergeant Bill and I went out to um, Tyler, Texas on Thursday, and we um, took part in the inaugural Rose City IDPA Championship. I swore that I would never shoot a match in July, especially in Texas, and I've broken that rule the last three years. This year at Rose City, last year in North Carolina, and the year before that in Iowa. All of it hot, sticky, nasty, generally awful. (laughs) I'm going to promise myself that I never do this again, but I'll probably do it again. Uh, Match directors uh, Samuel Chambers and Ben Petty, they they put on a really fun match, really innovative. All of it in one big bay, and you just worked your way through and shot one stage after another. There were four, really technically four stages set up, and then they made an adjustment in some of the target positions and some of the uh, barriers and things so that you you shot the same stage essentially in two different ways, and then you moved on to the next one, and there was nobody waiting you know, for another squad to move on. You just went through it. We, we knocked it out. I think we had 16 people, and I think we knocked out... Um, each stage in roughly 30 minutes. Eight stages. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And I want to thank uh, Rose City Flying Clays for putting on a really fun match. It was my first sanctioned match uh, in nine months. I haven't shot a sanctioned match since the fall brawl in October of last year. Medical and family issues kind of put my IDPA season on hold for half the season. So I'm pretty rusty. I had several malfunctions, inline double feeds that uh, cost me a lot of time. My accuracy wasn't great on a couple of stages where we had some farther targets and there was a couple where it really wasn't that far, but I rushed my shots. Um, But I I blame all of that on a severe lack of practice on my part. Um, So it's it's definitely time to ramp up the practice routine, the one that I, I had last year, and to get myself back in shape before October when my home range will be hosting the North Texas Regional uh, IDPA Championship. So what do we got going on on the show today, I hear you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. Most of the gang is here again this week. Sergeant Bill has a ballistic minute for us. Aaron Israel has a lesson for us based on another successful defensive gun use. Mia has tips for rifle shooters. And Pastor Bennett is still recovering from his, um, his vacation in California. So I am riding solo in clinging to God and guns again this week. Stick around for all of that. We've got a lot of great content coming your way after this brief timeout. You're listening to Armed Lutheran Radio, a proud member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. I want to take a minute here to thank our partner, the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. If you're involved in a situation where you have to use your firearm in self-defense, you very well may find yourself in a legal battle against overzealous prosecutors or the families of the criminal who you 
shot or threatened, who are looking to deprive you of your freedom or your hard-earned savings. You may find yourself charged with a crime or facing a civil lawsuit even if you did nothing wrong. That's where Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network comes in. For a small yearly fee, they will provide you with money for attorneys, money for bail, consultations, and access to experts like Marty Hayes and Masad Ayub. Don't face the fight alone. Visit Armed Citizens Network today. Use the promo code ARMEDLUTHERAN-25. Save $25 off your first year's membership, or you can grab the coupon on my website, armedlutheran.us. Sign up today. They will send you lots of cool resources, eight instructional DVDs, and a book by Masad Ayub that I cannot recommend highly enough. Don't wait until you need their help. Be prepared. Sign up today. Visit armedcitizensnetwork.org. It's time for this week's self-defense tip from Aaron Israel of Fundamental Defense. Hey folks, this is Aaron Israel with Fundamental Defense here with your personal defense tip of the week. This week I want to talk to you about an incident that took place at a gas station in Dallas about a week ago. A woman shot a man in the head as he tried to steal her SUV with her two children inside Wednesday night, Dallas police say. An employee of a gas station in the 200 block of West Camp Wisdom Road near the border with Duncanville alerted the mother at about 10 p.m. that a man was trying to get into her SUV. The mother, identified as Michelle Booker Hicks, told the station manager that she had been paying for gas at the time. She jumped into the vehicle. When the man didn't stop, she pulled a gun from the glove box and shot him in the head, police say. The vehicle then crashed into a utility pole. Brooker Hicks told KDFW she had recently gotten the gun to defend herself. I had to do what I had to do to defend myself and defend what was mine, which are my kids, she told NBC5. She had told the man her children were in the back seat and to pull over, but he didn't listen, so when... So she went to the glove compartment and grabbed the gun. The suspect, 36-year-old Ricky Wright, was taken to a hospital with injuries that were not life-threatening. He was booked into Dallas County Jail on Saturday and faces charges of unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. So let's break that down just a little bit, all right? Everybody wants to cheerlead the fact that this was a positive example. I've seen it all over the gun internet in Dallas the past past few days, people posting, hey, it's a win for gun owners, yay, concealed carry for the win, all of that stuff. And that's all fine and good. She had a positive outcome. But let's take a look at some of the mistakes she made that we can learn from, because that's what we're here to do and what we ought to be doing when we look at these incidents. So first off, she goes into a convenience store after dark and leaves her kids in the vehicle and leaves the keys in the vehicle. So there's a couple of mistakes right off the bat. So it's not a good idea to be at a convenience store after dark in the first place. They call those stop and robs for a reason because a lot of these type of property crimes and thefts and assaults happen at gas stations after dark. So don't be at those places. That's a bad place to be unless you can avoid it, right? Can't avoid it, right? So that's her first mistake. And if you do need to go into the uh, gas station after dark and you got kids with you, just take them with you. Or, at the very least, lock the door, right? That's still not going to be a great option, but it's better than leaving them in there with the keys and the ignition, right? Which is ostensibly what she did from what I'm reading in the story there. So take your kids with you, but really just don't be at a gas station after dark. Plan your life better so that you don't have to be at one of those places when the sun is down, because that's when a lot of bad things happen. That's why they call them stop and robs. So that's the first mistake. Second mistake is she left a loaded gun in her glove box with her two and her four-year-old in the vehicle. That is a terrible idea. There's all kinds of examples where kids have found guns in glove boxes or consoles and shot themselves or someone else that didn't need to be shot with those loaded guns. So if you're carrying a gun in a vehicle, there's two places that gun ought to be. That is on your person in a holster under your positive control, or if you're going into a non-permissive environment for some reason, which really wouldn't include a gas station, but maybe your place of work or like when I go to Six Flags or a baseball game where I can't carry my gun into the facility... I will lock it inside of a lockbox and secure it inside my vehicle. They make those little lockboxes that will cable tie to the underside of your seat for like $25 on Amazon. So there's really not an excuse for not having a way to properly secure your firearm inside the vehicle. And putting it in the glove box or in the console is not securing it. All kinds of bad negative outcomes that can happen when you do that. So don't do it. 
if you're going to have a gun for personal defense in a vehicle, just have it on your person. And that's the second thing. She gets into the vehicle and has to get the gun out of her glove box. Now, she just straight up got lucky there. What if the guy had run her over? What if he had beat her to death inside the cab? What if he had pulled a knife or a gun and shot her or stabbed her? Then we wouldn't be reading about this story. We'd be reading about a victim here, right? So everybody wants to cheerlead the fact that she was able to get to her gun, but she just straight up got lucky that she was able to get to her gun out of the glove box and defend herself with it. It could have very easily been a negative outcome in that regard, and she should have had a gun, the gun on her person. She probably doesn't have enough training or education to know that that's a bad decision to leave your gun uh, staged somewhere in your vehicle and not just carry it with you. And uh, if we cheerlead her her positive outcome and we don't talk about these things, then she doesn't learn that she made a mistake and doesn't do better next time. And more importantly, you and I don't learn about mistakes and how to do better next time. So carry your gun on your person if you're going to have it in the vehicle. And only if you're going into an an non-permissive environment should you have it anywhere but on your person, in my opinion. Now, there are some off-body carry options that exist for inside vehicles. I generally don't like them because they usually require you to have to take your gun out of its carry holster and put it into another holster of some kind to put it in a mount or whatever that they make for the vehicles. Most of those are just really dumb options. So I don't like those either. Uh, But definitely try to choose one if you if you go with that option, which I don't think is really great unless you're driving around the vehicle by yourself, but then you really can't make a good case for me of why it's not in the holster there. But if you do choose one of those options, make sure it's one where you don't have to take your holster, your gun out of your holster and put it into another holster because that's administrative gun handling where you could make a mistake and end up having a negligent discharge. And there's all kinds of examples I've read of that happening. So it really ought to be in a holster on your person, in your positive control, or secured inside of some type of lockbox if you go into a non-permissive environment. But carry it with you when you go in the gas station, and really don't be at a gas station in the first place after dark if you can avoid it. After that, she talks about not having wanted to hurt the person, but just wanting to fire a warning shot. That's a really dumb train of thought, really irresponsible, and especially not a super smart thing to say to the media, because that goes into the record as well, and she's lucky if she doesn't get charged with anything, honestly. In in Texas, probably not going to happen, but in other places, man, I tell you what, if you need to use deadly force, then that implies that you are in fear for your life. That is the standard for using deadly force, is that it's immediately necessary because you're in fear for your life. And if you say things like, I just wanted to fire a warning shot, that doesn't really uh, convey I was in fear for my life, right? So that's a dumb thing to say, and it's a dumb thing to believe. Uh, If you need to shoot somebody, you need to shoot them to stop them, right? You don't try to, there's no such thing as a warning shot. You shoot to stop somebody or you don't shoot them. You don't discharge the gun if it's not to defend yourself and stop the threat. So her mentality is all messed up there, which again is a, a result of lack of training and education, I'm sure. She needs to get more of that. We need to get more of that in general as a gun owning populace, and that's what I'm here for. That's why we're talking about this. So don't park at the stop and rob after dark. Make sure that your gun's on your person if you go into the gas station. Uh, Don't leave your kids in the car with the ignition running. Take them with you or uh, or at least lock the door, but take them with you is probably the better option. And really the best option is don't be at the gas station after dark. Plan your life better so that you don't have to make those kind of decisions. And then after that, don't count on luck, right? This lady got lucky, straight up. Luck counts, but you can't count on luck. My mentor, Rob Pincus, always says that. Uh, she got very lucky. Basically, she she drew she had a flush draw on the river, but it had complete air for cards up until that. If you want to use a poker analogy, and that's that might have worked in this instance, but in the long run, that is a dangerous mentality, and you don't want to count on getting lucky in these self defense situations because this could have easily easily been a negative outcome for this lady. So let's take a look at what she did wrong and learn from those things instead of just cheerleading the fact that she had a positive outcome. I'm glad that uh, she was able to stop the guy from taking her car with her kids in it. I'm glad it was a positive outcome for her, but I wish she would have made better decisions to A, have avoided the situation, or B, have been able to navigate it with just without just pure, unadulterated luck, which is the only reason that she is... Uh, able to talk to us about today. And last thing, but not least, don't go blabbing to the media right after one of these incidents. She was more than eager to talk to the media. She's been getting interviewed all over the place. Uh, and that's partly on us as a, as a, the pro gun people or a lot of the ones that are sticking a microphone in her face and asking her what she thinks about stuff. Don't do that. It's not a good idea to go talk to the media after one of these incidents, even if you think you're in the clear. Uh, give it some time and be very careful about what you say 
and uh, talk to a lawyer and all that good stuff before you ever go and talk to the media. So that's another mistake that she's making right there. It's probably going to be a fine for her. I don't expect she's going to face any charges or anything like that, but she very well could, depending on who the victim is and civil court and all that kind of stuff, right? So that's your personal defense tip for the week. Be smart about how you carry your guns and vehicles, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Aaron Israel is a personal defense network contributor and owner of Fundamental Defense. You can find out more and sign up for any of Aaron's classes at fundamentaldefense.com. Hey, if you're like me, you like shopping at gun shows. No pressure from sales staff, no need to bother them to ask to look at stuff. You just pick stuff up and dry fire it and look at it and hold it. Imagine if you could get that experience at your local gun store where you don't need to bother anybody. You don't have to ask people for help if you don't need it. You don't have salespeople hovering over your shoulders. Well, this is what it's like when you shop at G4G Guns. Cassie and Patrick Coburn are the owners, and you've heard them on the program before. They are absolutely awesome people, and they'll help you find exactly the right gear for you. But there's no sales pressure. You just browse the store. You pick up and hold anything that you want to look at without asking permission, just like at the gun show. And once you've found the gun you want, or if you actually do need assistance, Patrick and Cassie are there to help. It's the best of both worlds, gun shop and gun show, in one place. It really is the best. G for G Guns. They're located at 2035 Central Circle, Suite 108 in McKinney, Texas. They're open Mondays from 1 to 6, Tuesday through Thursday, 11 to 7. And on the weekends, you'll find them at a gun show near you. Or check them out online at G4G Guns. That's G, the number 4, G, guns.com. G4G Guns, the gallery for great guns. G4G Guns.com. Up next, it's Mia's Motivations with Mia Anstein. Hey you guys, it's Mia here again. How is it going? I hope you guys had a wonderful holiday and you've been enjoying your summer. I've been busy. Summertime, I guess all the time is busy, but in the summer, since it's such beautiful weather, I actually do a lot of teaching. We had our annual women's shoot here, which is a local event where we host Around 30 women, we teach them archery, 22 rifle and handgun if they would like, muzzle load, shotgun, and then we also teach them rifles. This year, I helped at the rifle station. This does vary every year, just depending where we need to fill in because I do teach a lot of different varieties of shooting, so I'm able to help out a lot. But this year, we needed help at the rifle station, so I helped introduce women to AR-style rifles, and that was a lot of fun. I wanted to share this event with you because it wasn't just fun, but it also was a great chance to educate some ladies who were a little naive on the the AR-style rifles. So at the station, we have ARs that have open sights. This one had a peep sight, and some people do have a challenge with that. They um, take some time to learn how to adjust the peep and get on target, but everybody, I will say, everybody did hit the target, so that was wonderful. And then at another station, we have one that has a red dot optic on it, and those are wonderful as well. If you are looking to put an optic on your AR, a red dot is great because you just put that dot on your target and that's where your bullet's going to hit once you get it sighted in, of course. And maybe I'll talk to you about some sight-in tips next week. But that red dot, the ladies that shot the red dot first and then came to the open sight, they were challenged. The ones who started with the peep sight and then went to the red dot, they actually had a lot more fun because they shot the more difficult one first. And so it was just the luck of the draw and how you were split at that station. But after the team would shoot at each station, then the really, really exciting part, and it's always a highlight at this women's event, was these ladies get a chance to shoot a 50 cal BMG. So I don't know how many of you guys that are listening have shot one. I think it is a blast to shoot one. And honestly, out of all the ladies, there was only one who was like, whoa, I'm not going to do that again. And I'll tell you, 
part of the reason that she said that is shooting position. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And when you get behind a rifle and shooting position, unless you're shooting a competition match with a 22 where you can actually in a standing position rest your elbow into your side or your hip for stability. You don't want to lean back when you're shooting a rifle. You always want to put your weight forward and in a ready stance, you want that weight forward. You want the stock of the rifle placed into the pocket of your shoulder. And this is something some women have a challenge with just because of their bodies, the way they're built. Some of them, um, have a little more difficult time getting the stock seated, but once they realize where that pocket is, it really, really helps. So when you get behind a rifle, whether you're standing, whether you're at a bench, whether you're seated, kneeling, and prone, you want to anchor the stock of that rifle into the pocket. You get situated behind it. And if you are in a standing seated or kneeling and you don't have a forward rest for the fore end of the gun, then you are going to have to put your hand up on that fore end to support the rifle. Now, when you're shooting this 50 BMG and if you're shooting long range, traditionally you will have a good rest. You'll have either a, the ground or a bench and you'll have a stable rest where you can have support for the fore end of the gun. And in that situation, that offhand that's not your trigger finger, that will go at the back of the stock and your hand will go right underneath the stock of the gun. It is there for support at the end and as the gun is in your shoulder, it'll be supported on that offhand. A lot of times you can get what's called a squeeze bag and you put that squeeze bag under the stock and that offhand can squeeze the bag to raise or lower the stock. And you do this in small movements, don't do big ones. The larger adjustment you do, the more difficult it is to find your target through a long range scope. So that is a big thing and as I said, that's one reason why the one young lady had a hard time and a lot of people ask about kick. This is part of where kick comes from. If you don't have the rifle seated in the pocket of your shoulder, you are going to feel kick more than other times. And that the kick issue is something that I really have a hard time talking about because I don't focus on kick. And if somebody asks me, does that gun kick? Well, no. Um, you know, a 50 BMG, are you going to be shooting that 30 times at a target? Probably not. And so kick is relative to what you're doing. It's kind of like when you're shooting shotguns. Are you going to put a target load in to shoot skeet or are you going to put a turkey load? If you put the turkey load, you're obviously not going to want to shoot that, you know, a hundred times. So that those are different aspects to having a concept of kick. And for those of you who may be teaching new shooters, think about that before you go. Don't start them off on that high caliber first. Get them to have their form down correctly first before you transition them up, which is partly why we started them on the AR style rifles. These were 223s and 556s, so a very low recoil type of gun. Once you have the shooting position dialed in, then we work on the shot. They get that target in their sights, so you're gonna get a rough sight through the optic or the scope. And once they're behind that, we need to remind them to breathe because a lot of people will hold their breath in anticipation of the recoil. And again, try not to focus on the recoil. Try to train and teach habits before we actually get them behind something that is massive and going to induce a shooting flinch. But the, the, there's an acronym that you can use. I just mentioned breathing, and this acronym is called BRASS. So first, you're going to breathe. Then you're going to release your breath only partially, and once you get about halfway out, you want to be aiming on target. So breathe, release, aim. Once you're aimed on target, that trigger finger, when you're shooting a rifle, you want to pull up the slack. So you've got breathe, release, aim, slack. So you're gently pulling that trigger, not slapping it, and you're pulling up the slack, and then 
the shooter will be surprised by the shot. So we've got breathe, release, aim, slack, and shoot. And that is how you have a good, steady, consistent shot and you are good behind the trigger. When you're shooting rifles and you're doing this for hunting or competition, do not slap the trigger. You want to gently pull that, let it be a surprise when that trigger clicks over and fires the shot. It is something that really is helpful, and if you're a longtime shooter, then and if you've been having trouble being accurate, give it a try. Focus on the steps of brass and see if that will help you become more consistent and have a great shot grouping. Until next time, have a great one, guys. Bye. You can read more from Mia and watch her YouTube videos at MiaAnstein.com. Let me take a moment to tell you about our membership site, the Reformation Gun Club. Members get exclusive content, all the segments, full-length interviews, full-length episodes of Clinging to God and Guns with extra content not released previously. They're kind of like the movies with the extended cuts or the director's cuts. Oftentimes what we have to do is trim those segments down so we can fit them into a reasonable time in the show, and that means extra content for you as a member of the Reformation Gun Club. You get access to our closed Facebook group, discounts from our partners like Gunbox gun safes, easy to see targets, Daltec Force, Cook's holsters, Talon gun grips, inline fabrication, much more. So go check it out on Patreon. We've moved to Patreon. Registration is much easier. You get your own unique RSS feed, which means you can paste that into your favorite podcast app and take it with you and listen anywhere. For as little as $2 a month, you can take advantage of all of those benefits and help support the show. Visit patreon.com slash armedlutheran or go to gunclub.armedlutheran.us and sign up today. Time now for another Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill Sylvia. Hey everybody, I'm Sergeant Bill and this is your Ballistic Minute. So today I'm going to talk to you something that's near and dear to my heart, <laughs> injuries and shooting. So here it is, July 13th or so, and uh, I just shot the Rose City IDPA, and it was the first match I've shot since, well, pretty much April 30th. So what have I been doing for the last couple months? Well, uh, I did a Ben Steger class on the 28th and 29th, and then the Texas State uh, IDPA match on the 30th. And with all the running around in the Ben Steggers class, which was awesome, by the way, and the uh, IDPA match up in Wichita Falls at Double Tap Ranch, I kind of fried at my knee a little bit, my left knee. So a little backstory. Um, in 96, I was in the Army, and I went skiing to Lake Tahoe on Martin Luther King weekend and um, kind of messed up my knee a little bit, you could say. So I wiped out, and you know, I made sure to have the skis the bindings loose or whatever and the left ski binding wasn't as loose as it should have been and uh, I wiped out and my right ski popped off my left ski didn't and I dislocated my left knee and it turned 180 degrees in towards the other foot tearing my ACL and tearing my medial collateral ligament the MCL so I spent about six months after that rehabbing it because the military was about to kick me out of the military for medical reasons. Yeah, so that was 96. Here we are in 2018. I've had lots of knee problems over the last 20 plus years. And it's just something I've had to deal with. So, probably had some partial tearing and or strains of both of those ligaments couple months ago and have been rehabbing them. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. How to deal with your uh, injuries that might affect you in shooting. So first of all, <laughs> hopefully you already know this, RICE. That acronym stands for rest, ice, compression, and elevation. <clears throat> so these are things you need to do when you have any kind of inflammation and or you know tendon or muscle type injuries. The rest, obviously rest it so it can heal. Ice it so you can keep the inflammation down. Take Advil, do whatever you need to to get that inflammation down. While it's inflamed, it's swollen, 
it's not going to heal. Compression helps to support the ligament or the joint or the muscle, whatever it may be, that you injured. Elevation helps to keep the blood flow in and out of that joint or that muscle or whatever it may be that you injured so that you can get better faster. So you need to give it time to heal. Give your injury time to get better. So I knew after those matches that I did and the uh, class that I did that my knee was pretty screwed up. I was icing it a couple times a day. I was trying to take it easy. I stopped running. I stopped cycling. I stopped any of the you know, physical activities I knew that was going to affect it, that was hurting. I mean, in all honesty, I was having a hard time walking for three or four weeks. While you're trying to heal up, there's always things you can do for your shooting game that you can continue to improve on. You can work on the skills that, you know, you can still do even though you can't, you know, do any movement. Work on your accuracy. Work on your transition. Work on your weak hand skills. You can still shoot, so you don't take time off. Don't let those skills degrade. Don't let your shooting ability degrade. Your movement skills are going to drop off. I mean, obviously, because, you know, like me, with my injured knee, I couldn't move. So after a few weeks of resting it and healing it, it's time to start rehab. So first thing you need to work on, like especially for me with a knee injury, I mean, I've done this many times over the last 20 years, you have to work on that flexibility. You've got to get that range of motion in your knee. You've got to take it nice and slow and let it come back slowly. Don't push it too far too fast or you can re-injure it. You've got to start strengthening it. And again, you've got to go slow. I was doing, a few weeks ago, I started out doing squats. And I mean quarter squats, not full squats, not weighted squats. I mean unweighted quarter squats where you're just barely bending your knee and then going straight back up. And it was hard for me to do. But I was doing those a few couple times a day. And then a couple days later, I was bumping it up to a couple sets of 10 and really working it and trying to get that strength and flexibility back in my knee. After a week or so or two of doing that, I was doing half squats. And then I started doing half lunges. So basically, for the last two months, I've gone from I could barely walk to now I shot a match a couple days ago. And even though I didn't do great at the match, my knee felt fantastic. It wasn't hurt. It wasn't swelling. It was a little sore the next day, but that's a strength issue. That's part of my rehab. That's something I need to keep doing, keep strengthening that knee. So if you have an injury and you want to keep shooting, keep shooting. If you have tendonitis in your elbows from shooting, learn the stretches you need to do, the strengthening exercises you need to do to get better and to still do the shooting that you can do until you get stronger and can do what you can do. Like with my knee injury, I did the things I needed to do to get better, to continue shooting. So keep practicing, keep dry firing, and always strive to be better. I'm Sergeant Bill, this has been your Ballistic Minute. Sergeant Bill Sylvia is a veteran of the Dallas Police Department and master class competitive shooter. You can watch Sergeant Bill's shooting videos at armedlutheran.us forward slash Sergeant Bill. All right, I want to take a minute here to thank our incredible sponsor, Cook's Holsters. They have been with us from day one when this show was just an idea, really, before we even started the podcast. And I was so impressed with Bob Cook and his products that I signed up to become a dealer. I wanted, I believe in the product so much, I wanted to sell it myself. Cook's Holsters makes custom Kydex holsters for range work, for concealed carry, for competition, Inside the waistband, outside the waistband, in a variety of colors and prints and mounting options, check out the new series of patriotic printed Kydex holsters as well. Those are really cool. And you may be asking yourself, every time you hear me talk about Cook's holsters, well, what's the big deal? Why should I trust Cook's holsters when there are so many other Kydex holster makers out there? Listen, Cook's makes the molds. 
and sells printed Kydex that many of the other holster manufacturers actually use to build their holsters. This is a great company. This is a great product. They come with a lifetime warranty against defects, a 100% satisfaction guarantee, or your money back. Check them out today at cooksholsters.com. Be sure to use the promo code Armed podcast, that's all one word, and save 10% off your order. Go to cooksholsters.com today. Up next, we're clinging to God and guns with Pastor John Bennett. Welcome to another edition of Clinging to God and Guns, where we debunk articles and videos that take scripture and misuse it to support a position in the gun rights debate. Today's article comes to us from the website Medium. It's by Joe Forrest, and it's entitled Blowback, The Christian Dilemma of Guns and Violence. Now, Mr. Forrest is an opinion writer at Medium, but that's really all I can find out about him. There's no bio for him. There's no info about his background, his education, past jobs. You click on his name, and all you get is a list of his articles. He does mention in another article that he grew up in a Christian home, but later when he went to college, he became enamored with progressive Christianity. And there are a couple of articles that he's written on guns. This one is the first of those. Uh, This was written in October of 2016, and it starts out like this. During the 12th century, crusaders often hired mercenaries to fight in their stead during the crusades. Because the crusades were viewed as a religious undertaking, the mercenaries had to be baptized before being deployed to the Holy Land. But as they were being submerged, the mercenaries would hold their swords above the water to symbolize that their swords were the one thing that would not surrender to Jesus. Now, I did a little research on this. I tried to figure out if there's any truth to this story, this idea that mercenaries in the Crusades wouldn't allow their swords to be baptized. And I couldn't find anything except for people like Mr. Forrest making references to it, Uh, as in, I read, or I've heard, or legend has it, and that's all that I can find. There's nobody who cites a source for this. One place that I read attributed this practice to the Knights Templar, which Mr. Forrest is is attributing it to mercenaries. I can't find any historical account of this. It's a story. It's not a historical event. I can't confirm it because it's a legend, and everywhere I read, that's exactly how they refer to it. So the, the preposition of this entire article, that Christian gun owners want to be baptized, but we still want our heathen weapons, is all based on this myth that has no basis in history. Okay, back to the article. This is an open letter to the evangelical Christians in the audience, the ones who are more likely than not to bristle at the bare mention of gun control or believe that dastardly U.S. government is looking to take away all your guns. Please try not to twist my words. I grew up in the South and am intimately familiar with gun culture in the United States. I won't be suggesting that U.S. citizens shouldn't have the right to choose whether or not they want to own a firearm. Instead, I'm asking what we, as Christians, should do with that choice. If you are a follower of Christ, this isn't a policy issue. It's a heart issue, and it's directly informed by your response to the gospel. Now, so far, except for the stupid crusader baptism thing, he's okay here. This is, I mean, the question of guns and gun violence is a heart issue. If you own a gun with evil intentions in your heart or hatred or a desire to kill someone who, who breaks into your house or tries to steal your car, and we've all heard those kinds of people, yeah, if they come into my house, I'll kill them. That's not good. As Christians, we should never want to harm anyone. We should not harm people. Even those who harm us or attempt to harm us. The fifth commandment forbids us from harming other people. But here's the problem with this question that the author poses. What should we as Christians do with the choice to own a firearm? We're not just Christians. We're what Luther called Christians in relation. This is from Luther's works, volume 21, the Sermon on the Mount and the Magnificat. A Christian has to be a secular person of some sort. As regards to his own person, according to his life as a Christian, he is in subjection to no one but Christ, without any obligation either to the emperor or to any other man. But at least outwardly, according to his body and property, he is related by subjection and obligation to the emperor, that would be the government, 
inasmuch as he occupies some office or station in life, or has a house or a home, a wife and children. For all of these are things that pertain to the emperor. Here he must necessarily do what he is told and what this outward life requires. If he has a house or a wife and children or servants and refuses to support them, or if need be to protect them, he does wrong. It will not do for him to declare that he is a Christian and therefore has to forsake and relinquish everything. Here it would be a mistake to teach, turn the other cheek and throw your cloak away with your coat. That would be ridiculous, like the case of the crazy saint who let the lice nibble at him because he refused to kill any of them on account of this text. So with that in mind, and after what was a decent start, Joe Forrest, our author, now decides to get snarky and stupid. He continues, Gun rights activists love to pepper their arguments with hypothetical scenarios. What if the teachers at Sandy Hook had been armed? A lot of people die in car crashes. Should we ban cars too? What if someone broke into your home and attempted to rape your wife or daughter? And then in parentheses, he says, as a side note, I'm pretty sure America's hypothetical wives and daughters are tired of being raped and murdered in order to make points about gun ownership and abortion. Not sure where the abortion thing comes in. Seriously, he says, what's up with that? And my response to that question would be, seriously, what's up with liberals who seem to think that rape is hypothetical or that unarmed teachers are safer than armed ones? What's up with liberal Christians who get so worked up about gun ownership and yet are silent on the question of the 60 million unborn in this country that we've murdered since 1972? I'm pretty sure that the thousands of American women who are victims of sexual violence are tired of anti-gun liberals like this guy who deign to tell them that they're safer without an effective means to defend themselves. Like the ones who say that they should just pee on their attempted rapists or use a whistle or a call box or that women aren't capable of using a gun to successfully defend themselves. America's wives and daughters are being raped and murdered, genius. There's nothing hypothetical about it. Over 130,000 rapes are reported to law enforcement every year. That doesn't count the ones that go unreported. That number has risen 12% since 2012. That's 368 rapes per day in this country. That's a rape every four minutes. That's a lot of raping. That's not hypothetical. This is the same level of stupid that says that the answer to rape is not to arm women or to teach them self-defense, but that we should teach men not to be raping. That's stupid. The complaint about hypotheticals is hilarious because it's leftists who always come up with the absurd hypotheticals. Like, if everyone has a gun, there's going to be blood in the streets. If... If we have guns on campus, there's going to be shootouts in our schools, on our, in our college campuses. It hasn't happened anywhere. Every argument's going to turn into a gunfight. Road rage is going to turn into gunfights everywhere. None of those hypotheticals has ever come true, despite the steady increases in concealed carry around the country and numerous examples of legally armed citizens stopping criminals. Back to the author. The deployment of questions such as these usually marks a turning point in any gun control debate, a point where emotional response and fear become as pertinent and often overrides data-driven research and biblical precedent, which is interesting because most of us understand that we shouldn't make lifestyle choices or policy decisions based on extreme hypothetical scenarios. This from the guy who started out the article with a legend about Crusader knights not baptizing their swords. When it comes to fear and emotion, the right and the left play this game and they play on people's fears in the gun debate. Both sides are guilty of it, but the left is entirely driven by it. Their fear of weapons that look scary, the, the idea that we can reduce violence with gun-free zone signs or magazine capacity bans or stupid background checks, the use of false and misleading terms like assault weapon or weapon of war, or my favorite, as you heard in a previous episode, weapons of mass destruction. The left is absolutely immersed in fear and not data-driven research. I mean, consider the data, quote-unquote, presented by the left, that states with stricter gun laws have fewer gun deaths. False. That the UK and Australia are safer because they banned guns. False. 
Women are more likely to be killed by guns in the home than to defend themselves. False. 40% of gun sales are done without a background check. Completely false. 90% of Americans want comprehensive background checks. Also false. Background checks will reduce suicides. False. 30,000 people a year die from gun violence. False. All of those claims by the left are, best case scenario, they're false. Worst case scenario, they're outright lies. So spare me the lecture about data-driven research or about making policy choices based on hypotheticals. That's exactly what the left does constantly. Back to our author. But that rationale and logic leaps right out of the window when we start questioning the role of firearms in the life of a follower of Christ. So in the spirit of fair and balanced debate, I'm sorry, I couldn't keep a straight face reading that sentence. Here are three hypothetical questions directed toward my brothers in Christ. If Jesus walked the earth today, would he be the keynote speaker at a National Rifle Association convention advocating our right to own assault rifles? Does blessed are those who own swords and defend their life, property, and liberty, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, thematically fit anywhere within the Sermon on the Mount? Which phrase flows quicker from your lips? Lord, I surrender all to you, or you can have my gun when you pry it from my cold, dead hands. I'm not trying to be provocative, he says. I'm just applying the same litmus test on gun control and violence that evangelical Christians place on other hot-button issues like abortion and gay marriage. After saying we shouldn't base decisions on extreme hypotheticals, he comes up with these dumb questions. If Jesus were on earth today, sure, I bet he would be the keynote speaker at an NRA convention. Would he, would he be the keynote speaker for Moms Demand Action or the March for Life? My guess is that he would just as likely speak to the NRA as he would to Moms Demand Action as he would to the March for Life. And you know why? Because he doesn't care if you own a tool. He cares about what's in your heart and what you would do with it. Would he speak at the Democrat National Convention? No, because the Democrats wouldn't allow him to be there because the last time they even mentioned God as part of their platform, that got booed. At least at the NRA convention, most of the people there actually believe he exists. Would he speak at Moms Demand Action? Probably. But he wouldn't be encouraging people to fight for gun control. He would be telling them to love their neighbors. Even the NRA members and gun owners whom they routinely call terrorists and murderers. Would he speak at an NRA convention? Yeah, probably. And he'd have the same message. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Even those hateful anti-gun leftists who want you and your family to die. Back to the author. Because the truth is, Jesus devotes way more airtime advocating peace and non-retaliation, see Matthew 5, 39 to 44, than he does rallying the troops to defend the sanctity of marriage. Um, really, rallying the troops to defend the sanctity of marriage. You see what he's doing here? You hypocritical conservative Christians, you get all worked up about marriage, but not about gun control. See, Jesus never said anything about gay marriage, but he did talk about peace. So much for not being provocative, I guess. Gun control was more important to Jesus than the institution of marriage that his father instituted in the Garden of Eden when he created the gender binary man and woman. Let's examine that claim, shall we? Let's look at Matthew 19, 4 through 6. Jesus answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. That's one direct quote, which itself quotes an earlier verse. See, Jesus only talked about marriage once, but wait. As Christians, unless you're a heretic, we confess in the Nicene Creed, Jesus, being of one substance with the Father, meaning Jesus is God, by whom all things were made, meaning he was present at the creation of the world. So Jesus was there with the Father at the creation of man and woman, and the declaration that man and woman shall become one through marriage. Jesus is also referred to as the Word, as we read, read at the beginning of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is God, creator of all things. Jesus is the word, the Bible, the story of God is the word. So wherever marriage is mentioned is God's word. Do a little Google search about verses about marriage and you'll find over a hundred examples. Look for verses about homosexuality and you'll find plenty of examples that make it clear it's a rejection of his design from the beginning for, for humanity. So Jesus, God, is pretty clear about marriage being between one man and one woman. The sanctity of marriage is clearly defined in Scripture and the opposite are clearly condemned, both in the Old Testament and the New. But search for the word sword. Not so much. And most of those references are metaphorical or historical. Not a single time does God prohibit the carrying of a sword. Not even once. Now, you didn't search for peace, I hear you say. No, I didn't because peace is, is not the absence of weapons. In most of the references in the Bible, peace is not mentioned in opposition to violence. It's a salutation. Um, it is used to refer to the absence of war but not an absence of weapons. It's a spiritual peace, an, an assurance of the peace of Christ with, which passes all human understanding. Not a single time does the Bible command the abolition of weapons or forbid the personal ownership of them. In fact, in his famous lesson in Luke 22, he commands the disciples to sell their cloaks and buy swords. To Jesus, the important thing was what is in your heart, not what's in your hand or in your sheath or in your holster or in your gun safe. Let's look at Matthew 5, 39 to 44 in detail, because he brings this up. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go a mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. He's talking about persecution, not common criminals. He's talking about retaliation and about vengeance, not about self-defense. The slapping you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also, um, basically is about being willing to, be, to continue to be insulted. Don't seek revenge when you are insulted. If someone would sue you to take your tunic, give him your cloak. If anyone forces you to go a mile, go with him too. This is talking about charity. This is talking about going above and beyond to help your neighbor. If you're asked to go a mile, which Roman soldiers could ask any member of a subjected race uh, to carry their crap. They could ask them to carry it for no more than a mile. That was the rule. So basically Jesus is saying here, if you're asked to carry stuff for, a, for a, one of your persecutors, if you're asked to go a mile, go two. Do more than what you're asked for. Show them love for neighbor by being willing to do more than is expected. That's what that verse is about. It has nothing to do with gun control. Back to the author. What is it about gun ownership and self-defense that stirs up such an intense emotional and judgmental reaction among most Christians? Any belief that ignites such a vitriol response in people that is not steeped in biblical foundation deserves to, deserves to be examined and cross-examined at great length. All right, this is projection. What is it about gun ownership that makes so many leftist Christians so uncomfortable? That's a fair question. Because I have seen and read more vitriol, more emotional outrage from the anti-gun Christian left than I've seen similar emotional response from the pro-gun Christian right. And speaking of judgmental reactions... It's the anti-gun Christian left that declares gun-owning Christians to be evil, bad Christians, terrorists, murderers. We don't care about children. We're idolaters. So before you go and cast aspersions at pro-gun Christians, maybe look yourself in the mirror and ask what it is about guns that brings out such evil and angry responses from anti-gun Christians. In my opinion, says Mr. Forrest, my fellow conservative evangelicals' propensity to elevate a doctrine of self-defense and gun ownership above the teachings of Jesus Christ himself represents a barrier to the gospel to those outside the faith. First of all, let me respond to that. I mean, that's, as he said, that's his own opinion, and you know what they say about opinions. But to call himself a, a conservative evangelical, because he says, my fellow conservative evangelicals, is a bit of a laugh. This is the guy who, in other articles, gushes with praise for progressive Christianity, and he suggests that people like Martin Luther 
and communist Dorothy Day were the progressives of their times. He's suggesting that we are elevating the doctrine of self-defense and gun ownership above the teachings of Jesus Christ. I, I would agree. To, to elevate the doctrines of man above the doctrines of Christ, the teachings of Christ would be uh, incorrect. But, as I said, and as we pointed out a million times on this program, there's not a single place where Jesus Christ suggests and declares definitively that you have no right to own a firearm or that you have no right to defend yourself. And this suggestion that our desire to protect ourselves and our loved ones and our neighbors, that love of neighbor through a willingness to own a gun or to use a gun for self-defense or, to, or just to own a gun for whatever purpose, to have a gun as a Christian, that that somehow is a barrier to the gospel for those outside the faith. Suggesting that firearms are just tools and that the problem of violence is the evil human nature, its original sin, or suggesting that your life and the lives of your loved ones are gifts from God, that's, that's a barrier to the gospel? What is the gospel? It's the good news that through his death on the cross, Jesus won for us the promise of eternal life through faith alone and through no merit of our own. So are we even talking about the same gospel here? Someone who thinks Shane Claiborne is a theologian and that Martin Luther was a progressive doesn't seem to know the gospel. Luther sought to return the church to orthodoxy, not to progress it and to change it into what it's become in America today. Progressive Christianity is all about works. It's about what you can do to prove how good you are, how much you care about people, how much you love the planet, the immigrant, the poor, the downtrodden, the gender confused, how tolerant you are. That's the kind of theology that Luther opposed and condemned. It, what, he's, what he's basically saying here is that the gospel is not enough, that, that the promise of the gospel, the promises of Christ— are not enough to attract people outside the faith. we got to have social justice. we got to have gun control. They're basing everything they do on temporal political agendas and not on the truth and the promises of the Bible, the promises that we can find in God's word, the promise that has been proclaimed to us has been those things have been replaced by political ideology and i think that is a huge barrier that is definitely a barrier to those outside the faith all right back to the author late one evening in august as i was wrestling with these ideas i bluntly posed that infamous hypothetical scenario to my wife shannon suppose we've both turned in for the night i said and at some point in the night i get out of bed to use the bathroom and when i get back i discover someone has broken into our home and is in the process of raping you at knife point. There is a pistol in the top drawer of my nightstand, and I race towards it. What would you want me to do? Now listen to this. A pensive look crosses over her face as she mulls over the question. After what seems like an eternity, she answers, I would rather be raped and murdered than have my husband be responsible for sending someone to hell. I don't like this answer. Joe here is condemning us for using a hypothetical mother or wife in our argument, but then he poses that same hypothetical question to his own wife. Would you rather be raped and murdered, depriving Joe of her love and companionship, their hypothetical children of their mother and her parents of their child, than to have the rapist suffer the consequence of his sin? In the hypothetical rape attempt, Mr. Forrest would not be sending the rapist to hell. He would be headed there as a consequence. The rapist is going there as a consequence of his own sin, of his own actions. I would suggest that Mr. and Mr. Forrest maybe should spend a little more time reading the Bible together rather than doing these r ridiculous hypothetical question games to prove how holy they are. Back to the author. In Matthew 26, Jesus is approached in the Garden of Gethsemane by an entourage of armed Roman soldiers and officials who are tasked with arresting him and bringing him before the Jewish high council. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, believing it is his righteous duty to defend the Son of God, draws a sword from underneath his cloak. The blade flashes, blood sprays, a severed ear drops to the ground. In the stillness that follows, Jesus turns toward Peter and says, Put your sword back into its sheath. For those who live by the sword, die by the sword. He finishes the quote from Matthew 26. I can't imagine that Peter liked this command. So this seems to me a delusion of grandeur. 
defending your, your wife from a rapist is not the same as Peter defending Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He commanded Peter to put the sword away because Peter was standing in the way of his purpose to go to the cross to die for our sins. Remember that gospel thing. The pacifists who misread this ignore some obvious facts that destroy their argument. And this guy's doing the exact same thing. The first being that, as we pointed out before, Jesus said, put your sword back. He didn't command him to throw it away. He didn't reprimand him for having it or carrying it. Secondly, being that he's God and that he knows all things, he knew that the disciples were armed and had been for some time. In fact, when he commanded the disciples to go buy one, they said, hey, we've got two. He knew they had two. And not once did he ever reprimand them for doing it. Back to the author for a couple of stupid sentences. But Jesus isn't through yet. In the Gospel of Luke, we're told Jesus reaches out and heals the man that Peter struck with his sword. This would be Luke twenty-two fifty-one. Do you understand the gravity of what has just taken place? In the final hours before his life, Jesus healed someone who was sent to deliver him to be crucified. Again, it's not like Jesus had plans to resist, genius. He conveniently overlooks the verse in Luke twenty-two thirty-six. Earlier that same evening, when Jesus commanded his disciples to sell their cloaks and buy those swords. Why would he have done that? Well, for whittling and chopping wood, obviously. Early followers of the faith used to say, when Jesus disarmed Peter, he disarmed all Christians. According to church tradition, nearly all Jesus' original disciples were tortured and murdered for their faith. Even in the midst of intense persecution by the Roman Empire, early Christians willingly laid down their lives for their beliefs and fellow believers. When we send missionary families to dangerous mission fields like Somalia or Iraq, we don't send them overseas with rifles and crates of ammunition in case they have to defend themselves, quote unquote. At the same time, most Christians would rightly view wherever God has placed them at any given point in time as their mission field, including the U.S., So I have to ask, why is it okay for U.S.-bound Christians to arm themselves to the teeth to protect their home and well-being, and yet not okay for international mission families to do the same thing in a much more dangerous part of the world? The early followers who said the thing about Jesus disarming all Christians, yeah, that was the heretic Tertullian. Um, Only pacifist loonies actually use that quote. So go back and listen to episode 80, where we thoroughly debunk that nonsense. Jesus's disciples did not defend themselves and were martyred because, unlike the followers of Muhammad, they were not trying to spread Christianity by force. And the same is true for missionaries. They're not spreading the faith around the world by force. You, in your everyday life, everyday Joe, standing in your house, In your car, walking down the street, you're not one of the apostles. You're not a missionary trying to convert that rapist or that home invader, the carjacker or the murderer or the gangbanger. They are not going to be stopped or converted by your desire to tell them about Jesus. The fact that you have to ask the difference between the missionary in Iraq and the housewife in Cleveland shows just how ridiculous this whole argument is. The guy coming to your door to kick it down, the guy raping your wife at knife point, is not doing it because you're a Christian. They're not doing it to persecute you because you are a Christian. They're doing it because they're sick and they're evil. It has nothing to do with persecution, which is why the apostles were all killed. They were killed for their faith. Your wife would not be hypothetically raped for her faith. So let's go back to the author. Um... Let's return to that distressing hypothetical I posed to my wife, the one with rape and murder that gun rights activists like so much. I'm not implying that I would do nothing while my wife is being brutalized. That would be evil. I would do everything in my power to protect my future wife's honor and life. If it came down to it, I would die for her, but I will not kill for her. You would rather she be raped and brutalized than have to kill to defend her. Remember that thing from Genesis about the two of you becoming one flesh? You're entrusted by God to protect and defend your wife. Her life is a gift from God. The murderer, the rapist, violating the fifth and sixth and ultimately the first commandments, violating the laws of God. That's what you're faced with. And the fact that you will not do anything to stop it if the only choice is to use a gun shows just how little you understand about God's law and about God's grace. 
In 1525, in response to the lawlessness and rebellion and murder being committed by the, the peasants during the peasant revolt, Luther wrote this, and I'm reading from Against the Robbing and Murdering Hordes and Peasants, Luther's Works, Volume 46. And uh, Luther says, In the second place, they are starting a rebellion. They are robbing, they are violently robbing and plundering monasteries and castles which are not theirs. By this, they have doubly deserved death in body and soul as highwaymen and murderers. Now, you, know, you might say, okay, well, basically, Luther's saying that the government needs to come in and put these people down, right? No, listen to this. Anyone who can be proved to be a seditious person is an outlaw before God and the emperor, and whoever is the first to put him to death does right and well. For if a man is in open rebellion, everyone is both his judge and executioner. Just as when a fire starts, the first man who can put it out is the best man to do the job. For rebellion is not just simple murder. It is like a great fire which attacks and devastates a whole land. Therefore, let everyone who can smite, slay, and stab secretly or openly, remembering that nothing can be more poisonous, hurtful, or devilish than a rebel. If you do not strike him, he will strike you and the whole land with you. What is a murderer? What is a rapist? If not a rebel against the established order, against the laws of the state and the laws of God himself. Back to the author. This is probably why Jesus didn't say, Greater love hath no man than this, to take a life in defense of a friend or one's own self. Again, with the hypotheticals. Con conversely, you could say, Well, Jesus never said, Greater love hath no man than this, to sit back and do nothing while your wife is being raped at knife point. Again, let's look at, at Luther's words here. Let's, let's look at his explanation of the fifth commandment in the large catechism. What is the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment, thou shalt not murder. So listen to this. A person who does evil to his neighbor is not the only one guilty under this, the fifth commandment. It also applies to anyone who can do his neighbor good, prevent or resist evil, defend and save his neighbor so that no bodily harm or hurt can happen to him, yet does not do this. For you have withheld your love from him and deprived him the benefit by which his life would have been saved. God also rightly calls all people murderers who do not provide counsel and help in distress and danger of body and life. So the fifth commandment, which forbids us to murder, to harm our neighbors, also commands us to protect Back to the author. I'm not saying that we should abolish the Second Amendment. I'm not saying, but it should only apply to non-Christians. Uh, I'm saying that he didn't say that. I just inserted that myself. Sorry. Um, I'm not saying that citizens shouldn't have the right to own firearms. They just shouldn't ex exercise it if they're Christians. Sorry. Again, I couldn't help it. But as Christians, we're meant to be Christ's ambassadors to a fallen world, a world already inundated with violence and bloodshed committed generally by people who aren't Christians. But I digress. Uh, we are also commanded to emulate Christ in all that we do. And he quotes John 13, 15 here. And when Christ arrived on the scene, he made a point to liberate his people and to conquer death with the cross, not with the sword. I can only imagine how confusing it must be for non-believers to see us coming at them with a Bible in one hand and an AR-15 gripped in the other. It must certainly make for an awkward hug. Joe, I mean this with all sincerity. Please give up this progressive stupidity and go back to God's word and study it. Law and gospel rightly divided and get out of this progressive BS. If I own that weapon, whatever that weapon is, with a desire to use it on another human, that's not good. As Jesus says in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. So it's what's in your heart that makes a person evil. Owning a tool for lawful purposes, for hunting, for competition, for collecting, for self-defense against criminals or tyranny, that's not a sin. It's only a sin if in your heart you desire to use that tool to harm someone else. My ownership of an AR-15 or a katana or throwing stars has absolutely no effect on my ability to love my neighbor. In fact, if you listen closely to Luther's explanation of the fifth commandment, 
ownership of those weapons may actually make it easier for me to love my neighbor if I see them in distress. Non-believers aren't sitting back saying, you know, I could buy into this whole Jesus thing if it wasn't for AR-15s. They're not trusting in the gospel. They're not coming to church. They're not uh, converting because our churches are selling a progressive ideology that is all about politics and not about God's promise. If they are joining the church because of these social justice things like gun, gun control or open borders or gay marriage or environmentalism, then they aren't being moved by the Holy Spirit. They're just joining a social club that supports their progressive politics. Well, I think that wraps it up. I hope you uh, enjoyed this episode. Thank you for spending the time with me. If you have any questions about anything you heard here, or if you have any suggestions for a future episode, please visit our feedback page, armedlutheran.us slash feedback, and leave us a voicemail, a voice message, or an email. We'd love to hear from you. Tune in next time to another edition of Clean to God and Guns right here on Armed Lutheran Radio. And that's going to wrap it up for this week's show. Thank you all for listening, for downloading, for subscribing. Thank you to our fine sponsors who make all this possible. Thank you to my awesome cast of contributors. And thank you, dear listener, for listening, for downloading, for subscribing. I hope you'll join us again next week. Until then, keep shooting, keep praying. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Armed Lutheran Radio. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, and tune in. This podcast is made possible by Cook's Holsters and contributions from listeners like you.